Well, good evening and uh, welcome uh, to uh, the RASC um, Montreal Center, uh, our virtual version, of course. Um, and even though this has been a strange year with strange times and uh, not being able to see each other, which normally would have had a fantastic night together, uh, we'll still have a fantastic night all together, just apart. And um, that said, it hasn't stopped the RASC after 100 years. Um, not even a pandemic will stop us from enjoying and sharing the splendors of the night sky and uh, sharing friendship and um, and just our passion for everything night sky and even day sky uh, with solar. Um, so uh, before we start our main presentation, um, I'd, I'd like, like once again, I'd like to welcome everybody to the RSC Montreal Center. And uh, you know, we were founded in 1868. Uh, the RASC is Canada's leading astronomy organization with 29 centers and 4, 000, more than 4,000 enthusiastic amateur, educator, and professional members. We're the largest, most active astronomy group in Canada, and the Montreal Center has 170 plus members of all ages. So uh, if you uh, join us, and uh, our, we have special programs offered by uh, our center, public events and talks, clubhouses at the Bellevue Observatory during normal times, uh, our newsletter, Skyward, which, which is a fantastic way to keep in touch with what's going on uh, with the uh, Montreal Center. Uh, our Bellevue Observatory, which we're really proud of, and uh, we have a new mount as well, um, a really powerful mount for my Optron. Uh, so when we'll get back to observing, hopefully in 2021, um, uh, we have a 14-inch Mead, uh, Richie Kretschian, kindly donated by David Levy and the Mead Corporation. And um, a Willy Woods is our official dark sky site where we have the 16 inch uh, uh, Explore Scientific uh, Bumblebee Telescope for people to share and enjoy. And uh, plenty of events, parties and workshops. And once in a while we even have um, famous people, astronauts, scientists uh, join us um, uh, for incredible talks. Um, so uh, you can go to our uh, website at rascmontreal.org for more details. And uh, we have library nights at John Abbott College uh, at our I.K. Williamson uh, Library, where there's a wealth of uh, information from, well, decades ago all the way up to today. You can borrow books and equipment and uh, um, incredible resources um, during um, non-COVID times, of course. And uh, every year when we can get together, uh, we have our telescopes, uh, rental and swap sales. We have a, uh, holiday um, uh, dinners and uh, all kinds of events. And uh, for the fall 2020 members events, we have a members clubhouse Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Guests are welcome to join in. We never close the door to anybody. And um, members in-person events on hiatus for uh, just, uh, you know, for obvious uh, COVID reasons. Uh, but on October 13th, uh, coming up, uh, whether the world is still here or not, is the Mars Opposition, which is amazing this year because Mars is as closest as it's gonna to be to the Earth, and no, not the size of the full moon or something from our point of view, but still very large in a telescope uh, because it's one of the better oppositions um, in our, well, natural lifetimes, at least for quite a few decades to come. So take advantage of that when you can. Uh, November 14th is our annual general meeting presented on Zoom for the first time ever. So we highly encourage everybody to be there. Uh, we need the support of a quorum to make sure that um, items are passed, uh, to make sure that the center runs smoothly. And on December 13th is the Geminids meter shower and much, much more. So as you know, we've been keeping very active even during these strange times, uh, we haven't let go. And so much thanks goes out to uh, a lot of our teammates and uh, people on the board and, um, you know, Karim for pulling a lot of these events together and, and many others. Uh, so thank you to everybody. Next, please. And of course, uh, we have Explore the Universe, which is a, um, a program that you can, uh, um, there's different levels and uh, uh, different um, uh, certificates that you can earn and uh, go at your own pace and really enjoy the, the passion of exploring the night sky. So this is pretty amazing. And you can find that information on our website uh, listed here. And um, we have a YouTube channel as well where you can watch uh, videos of the past um, and, uh, and little mini movies that we've done, um, you can see from the center as well. Um, and, uh, and that's it for this. So, um, 
today, uh, oh, I'm sorry, on uh, October 10th, um, there's an upcoming uh, um, a Zoom event, which is really incredible. It's the orbiting lunar station known as the, uh, the Lunar Gateway. This is that massive space station project uh, being developed by NASA and its uh, partners, including Canada and uh, Japan and, uh, and Europe. And this is actually a mini space uh, station to be placed around the moon's orbit to allow for descent and ascent to the moon, uh, long duration stays, and uh, pretty well the openings of permanent settlement on the moon for exploration. And uh, this is going to be an incredible talk because we have Dr. Jamil Sharif, uh, who's an astrophysicist, and um, he's a member of the technical staff at McDonald uh, Detweiler and Associates, the people who are helping to uh, build the actual arm that's going to be on the, the gateway. And this is actually happening for real. This is not just on paper. This is being built right now for launch in 2023. Uh, so uh, click here to register for the event and, um, and make sure you're registered for this event because it's going to be amazing uh, on that evening. I can't wait for it. Um, so uh, it's in association with John Abbott and that's going to be a really amazing night. We actually have someone working on this for real with us. So that's really exciting. Um, and, uh, and that's it. Look, so you can look forward to that. And uh, we have uh, to thank our partner events. We have um, our partner events with the Cosmodome, uh, Crater Sketching by um, one of our amazing members, Bettina Forget, um, who's actually a doctorate in uh, what she does with um, uh, a beautiful like artwork inspired by astronomy. It's really amazing stuff. And that's on October the 4th at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, it's also a virtual Zoom meeting. Uh, so uh, please note the, um, uh, the link here and we can provide links afterwards. But uh, there's the Anna, um, Anna I. McPherson lectures in the Physics 2020 McGill Department of Physics, public lecture on event, uh, online event on October 1st, a scientific le uh, lecture, uh, listening for gravitational waves above the quantum uh, din. And this may sound kind of mysterious and everything, but if you've always wanted to know about these things, um, now's your chance. And uh, 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 if I'm spelling it right or pronouncing it right, Nergis um, Mavala, uh, Vala, Mavala. Um, uh, she's a Marvel professor of astrophysics and dean of science at MIT. That's another incredible um, uh, person. Um, you know, we're, we're real, really lucky because uh, even though we're not connected physically, we have connections and access to amazing people doing really incredible uh, leading edge work in the, uh, in the sciences of, of uh, astrophysics. Um, so I, I'm sorry for butchering up that name, but um, please keep that on your uh, calendar for October 1st. Uh, and that's at 6.30 Eastern time. And uh, there's a QR code that makes it easy for you. Um, and uh, like I said, we can provide more of these links uh, and these posters as they go out to uh, members. Um, thank you. Okay, so um, tonight's, a, tonight's a very special night um, because it's International Observe the Moon Day, and this is being uh, watched around the uh, world uh, today. We're looking at the moon. Right now here in Montreal, the moon is a little, well, it's a little under the haze or clouds. Actually, I'm looking right up now my balcony and I could see that it's pretty well all clouded out. But don't worry because we have tons of moon stuff to, to bring you and gorgeous photos and sketches. And, uh, and um, one of our amazing members, Nicole Laporte, will, will be your, um, your person for tonight talking about, uh, about the moon in general. And then uh, she'll pass it over to uh, myself and Paul Smart, who's here with me. Um, and we'll show you some beautiful examples of photography and sketches from members that have been submitted over the past few weeks. So get ready for an amazing night. And um, so it's observing the moon and uh, what can you see on the moon? And uh, liaise, uh, um, uh, join uh, Nicola Part, our RAC Montreal members liaison, to explore the wonderful companion, the moon. And the moon is often um, forgotten in a way uh, because, you know, we're interested in planets and galaxies and all these, but the moon is so large in our, in our telescopes and in the sky, you don't need much to really enjoy looking at the moon. As a matter of fact, your naked eye is all you really need for, for many things. So um, without 
uh, any further delay, I will introduce you to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you um, for that nice introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now and find my okay, share screen. Oh, okay, there's my presentation. Does everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. You might want to put it in yeah. presentation mode. I think F5. Yeah. Okay. So welcome everybody. So tonight is International Observe the Moon Night. Um, and I'll be talking a bit about this event, an international event, and also about Explore the Moon Observation Program uh, from RASC. So International Observe the Moon Night tonight, September 26, is an event where everybody, everyone on Earth is invited to observe and learn about the moon. Um, this event began 10 years ago as an outreach event for NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission and has grown to an international event. Um, last year, 102 countries participated. Um, and you're wondering, well, why September 26? Why on t today? Um, the criteria for choosing the date, it's, they like to have it as a Saturday in autumn near the first quarter moon. Why the first quarter moon? Because it's high in the sky after sunset and you can see many features along the Terminator. So it's good for public outreach. Um, obviously because of COVID, we can't share telescope view, but this is a good time to uh, observe the moon. And they've already picked the dates for next year. Um, October 16th and then two years from now October 1st. So that's International Observe the Moon Night, like they say, everyone, everywhere, every year. And what we'll be talking about tonight specifically is the, um, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Explore the Moon Observation Program. David quickly talked about Explore the Universe, um, but Explore the Moon is more specifically for the moon. And what the purpose of the program is like, I'll be talking, why do we want to look at the moon? And then I'll be talking about the targets, what to look for and when on the moon, the equipment you'll need and resources available to members. Okay, so explore the moon. Um, the purpose is to encourage amateur astronomers through visual observation and recording. And it's an introductory lunar observing program, so it's suitable for all levels. Um, and why look at the moon? Well, the moon is easy and interesting target with many beautiful features. Only basic equipment is required. There'll, there's two programs. You can have the binocular program or the small telescope program, or if you have a large telescope, that's good too. <laughs> and another advantages, there's no need for dark sky sites. The moon can be viewed from urban areas. Even if you live downtown, you could do this program. Um, and here's the logo of the program. Okay, so if, if you're gonna do the binocular uh, program, there's 40 targets um, as shown here that are visible. And for the telescope program, there's 100 targets and all the the moon maps are based on the observer's handbook that every RASC member gets um, maps are available and the observing is structured it's based on Q days and Q days means quarter moon so the quarter moon is zero and then from there um, if you look at the example of this calendar here, so on the 23rd, we were, it was the, f the, um, uh, the quarter moon, first quarter, and that's zero. The day before that was minus one, minus two, minus three, up to minus five. So you're almost close to the, f the new moon. And after the first quarter, then it's day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Um, so it'll make more sense with the next slide. So. What it means is that f this is for the binocular program. You see there's day minus five and then minus four, minus three. So what it means is day minus five is um, where the terminator 
of the moon is, where the lit part of the moon is. So when uh, a few days after the full of the new moon, only part of the moon will be lit up and you will see the terminator here. And so as each day goes by, um, more of the moon is lit up. And then the first quarter, the half moon, day zero, is where you'll see your targets. So for example, uh, tonight, um, the targets, one of the targets would be the Kepler um, crater which is located here. So it makes sense if you look at it. Um, here are the gang of four craters are located along here. So it's, it's really based on how the features are organized according to their position on the moon. So it makes the program easy. So you look at the program and then it kind of helps you to set which target you want to look at. Because you always want to look at targets that are close to the terminator. And the terminator is the line between the light and the dark where the shadows will be long and you can see a lot of details in the craters. Um, and also, uh, as you see here, there's the days, but there's these letters here refer to and the north, the equator region, and the southern region. So if you look at one of these, then it, you say, okay, minus two east, so you, equator. So you know that it, your targets are in this area somewhere. So that's how it's organized. Um, the equipment that you'll need. Well, if you do the observe, the uh, binocular programs, you want a um, binocular that's seven by 30 or more, but seven by 35 will be good. Um, seven refers to the magnification and 35 is the diameter of the lenses. And for a telescope, you can start off as something as small as a 60, a small 60 millimeter telescope like this one here behind me. And if you have bigger ones, that's even better. You'll see more detail. Um, so that's the equipment you need. And then you also need to record your observations. Um, there's different uh, places you can get on the RASC website, uh, some observation sheets. Um, oh, actually, uh, you can audio record, but apparently for now, um, you, the f you can't just photograph the moon. If you photograph the moon, that's fine, but you need to write down the date and the time that you saw your observations. Or you can also sketch in pencils here what you've seen your observations. Um, so the tools you'll need are, if you're sketching it, are the pencils. And don't forget your red light, because it's if you get all set up and you're ready to sketch or write down your observations and you realize you can't see anything, that's not very good. <laughs> so don't forget the red light. And um, the red light is for your night vision. But with the moon, you can get away sometimes too with the white light because the moon is so bright that it's not like when you do other observations of nebulas and that. So but it's still, it's, it's good to have a red light. And good to have are insect repellents, warm clothes, chair, maybe a moon map or moon atlas. atlas. Oops, sorry, went too fast. Um, so on the RASC National website, they have the resources that you need. They have um, the Explore the Moon with the Binoculars. That's a whole document that'll explain the program to you. And also the one with the small telescope. And at the end of your observations, when you've recorded all your observations, you can fill out a certificate, apply for a certificate, and then a RASC representative will sign it, and then you can get your certificate. Um, for the, you'll get a pin if you do the small telescope, program, you get a pin that looks something like this here, um, but you don't get a pin for the binoculars. It has to be the telescope program. And also another good resource on the RAS National website is the photographic album of lunar features. And it goes, um, it, it shows you all the features that you'll need for the program. Because sometimes when you look at the moon, there's a lot of craters and you kind of get lost which one is which and this will help you out. There's also a lot of resources on the internet for looking, finding out what the moon is. Um, Stellarium is another good resource. It'll show you uh, where the moon is, when, and you can zoom in and see what parts are lit up that night. Um, also, 
you can also have uh, in PDF format free to download is um, I created a sort of a logbook. So how the logbook works is that I made a page for each crater and it follows the program. Um, so you have the name of the crater. Um, OH is the observer handbook label. The observer handbooks has a moon map in it and it has um, that's the label it'll be labeled and also i put by craters because um you not only look at craters this observe the, this program you also look at basins which is maria kind of seas there's mountains there's also landing sites apollo landing sites some of these are optional but there's a hundred um targets that you can choose from uh, only a few are optional i think it's the landing sites that are optional and from there, okay, so that's that's pretty much um, the the program. And um, also another good thing about, uh, I forgot to show, doo, 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 is that there's also description. Um, this is taken from uh, this document here. And there's a short description of what exactly you're looking at. So that can help you to, to figure out uh, what are some of the features you can pay attention to? Um, and there's no time limit on this program. And um, the way it works, it's only for the waxing part of the moon. That's from new moon to full moon, because that's when it's visible in the evening. After the full moon, the moon gets um, starts to uh, rise later and later and later and it, it gets to be too late. So this is program is really geared towards evening viewing. Um, and there's no time limit because sometimes some days um, it's cloudy and you can't observe. So that's why you have to be patient and just do a bit each month. And um, that's pretty much it. Are there any questions? I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, where can I find this document? This document here is on the RASC national website. Uh, the, you, this is here is um, the address. Do you see that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if I can put it on the chat. I'll try to. Oh, I don't know. No, I can't. Um, I, I posted a link on the chat. Oh, thank you. Okay, <laughs> great. So there's a link on the chat and there's also a video, but in Zoom, the videos don't work, but there's a nice video by, um, I think it's by Robert Reeves, who explains the program quite well um, as well. So it's it's quite an interesting program and it's fun to do um, because I said the moon's always easy to find. And um, even if you don't have dark skies and it, it kind of, uh, if you're a bit scattered with your observation, it kind of helps you to focus on your your observations. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions for Nicole? I know you've done some uh, really nice uh, sketches, uh, Nicole. You, you wouldn't have to have one around that you could just flash for us. Um, I think or is that um, David's going to show Paul, that. Yeah, yeah Paul and David are going to show that. Yeah, yeah. we're absolutely we're going to show that to everybody. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I because after this, um, um we're going to show uh, photos and ske and sketches and stuff from members. Um, but the moon's a very interesting target. And um, also, if you've just bought a new telescope and you're not sure how to use it, the moon's a great way to start practicing because it's an easy target so you won't get too frustrated. So uh, it's, it's good to practice. And if you want to get into astrophotography, maybe the first few photos could be of the moon because it's, it's not too difficult. So the moon's great to practice with. And uh, I know some uh, amateur astronomers, they, they curse the moon when it's very bright and they can't see anything else, but you should, when it, the moon's bright, just enjoy the moon. <laughs> and, and you know what? I, I find that in the years I've been doing astronomy, um, the moon, although it has the same phases, it always seems to be a different view because as time goes on, the liberation of the moon, the way it yeah. tilts from our point of view, actually reveals some things you can't always see 
uh, from month to month. So uh, there always seems to be old friends that you can view, like Plato is one of my favorites, beautiful yeah. uh, crater with uh, like a lava flow uh, flat bottom. It's just gorgeous with the mountain peaks and the shadows. But uh, it's never the same view twice, I find. So it's always fascinating to take a look at the moon. Yeah, even within the, if you observe all evening, even from a, a two hour period, because the shadows are so long, you'll see different things appear and disappear. So it's really neat. And like you say, from month to month, even though it's first quarter, it might be a few hours later, a few hours earlier. Um, you know, because first quarter is never in exa at the exact same time. It could be at three o'clock in the morning or at five in the afternoon. It really depends of the month. It always changes the exact time, first quarter. And he, yes. so, yeah, it always changing month to month. And also the moon kind of wobbles a bit. I don't have a video of that, but it kind of wobbles from month to month. Because so what you see here is not always exactly the same. Some months, this moon will be at uh, this, the Mer des Cris will be a bit more towards the left, some day, some, another month a bit more towards the right. So you get a little bit different views. Well, um, I'd like to thank you kindly for a great, uh, in, um, a great talk about the moon tonight. And it shows that you have passion for our local neighbor. Um, you also have amazing sketches that we've seen over the past few years. Um, and always fascinated the way, instead of just simply taking a, um, a cell phone or a camera mm -hmm. and just taking pictures, you actually take the time to really sketch out what you see. And I love those little um, pastel type of, um, those little cards that you have um, yeah. are, are amazing. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead um, and share um, some uh, members and also from uh, John Abbott College uh, students, uh, um, have kindly submitted some of their moon images and sketches. Uh, so um, we'll go through this here and uh, observing the moon, uh, select photos and sketches from members of RSC Montreal and, and uh, John Abbott uh, students. Uh, in no particular order, um, over the past few weeks, like, a, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we've been collecting some moon photos. Uh, from, from members and sketches. And uh, these are from Ben Chu Tang, uh, moon photos. And um, I'm not sure if you guys can see, but you have like the different phases of the moons. And as Nicole was mentioning, the Terminator, um, you know, is the place where you see the most depth and three dimensional uh, features of the moon because that's where the shadows meet, uh, you know, the light. And oftentimes during a full moon where people would expect that's when you should really look at the moon, it's actually uh, flatter looking. So uh, the interesting times to look at the moons in certain features are definitely during the Terminator. And this is very visible with these uh, gorgeous images from Ben Chu. Here's a, another uh, three in a set. Uh, these are pretty close up actually. Um, and uh, it's just so dreamy when you look at these things. It feels like you're really outside the Apollo you know, a uh, lunar module uh, on its descent, and you can actually see uh, close-ups of, of the, the riles and, and, the, and the mountains and valleys of the moon, because uh, um, although the moon's, you know, um, a lot of people uh, know that the moon's pretty, like, quote-unquote, lifeless, it still has amazing features uh, that are both alien-looking to us, but also very familiar, um, like mountains and ranges and, and things. Uh, so thanks to Ben Chu for these amazing close-up images. Carl Jorgensen uh, has submitted a set of images here. And um, this one's from October the 4th, 2019 at 710. And uh, he's using a 60 millimeter by 900 millimeter refractor, an Altair, using the 15 millimeter eyepiece and a smartphone and a universal smartphone adapter. See, he was able to take this shot of the moon and uh, this is from his balcony in, in Greenfield Park. And this goes to show you that you don't need all these kind of crazy, sophisticated, powerful uh, CCD cameras and CMOS sensors. Um, you can use something that 99% of us have, you know, our smartphones, and just simply point it to the eyepiece, even handheld, um, especially with the rubber part of the eye cup to help uh, stray light uh, from uh, inhibiting the image. And you can get some fantastic images. Here's um, an actual image on July 29th uh, from this summer. And um, it was the LG smartphone and it's seven photos of the moon and Venus. 
uh, with the smartphone, you displayed the best photo. The photo was cropped and seeing was a three in transparency at two, and yet he was still able to capture this amazing uh, series of photos uh, simply from his uh, front door. So you don't have to travel far um, to get the bright images of the moon, obviously. See, so, yeah, on March 7th of this year, a gorgeous, almost full uh, moon here. And you could absolutely see the beautiful three-dimensional details on the limb of the moon um, and uh, just the rays coming out of the craters. It's just amazing. Um, so this was, was the 90 millimeter uh, by 1,000 millimeter ref, um, focal length refractor. Um, he connected his DSLR um, to, uh, to the, um, the telescope and photographed 11 photos of the moon at prime focus. So prime focus is when you're not adding extra eyepieces or magnification you're using the actual telescope itself as essentially a telephoto lens. And uh, this is the best of the 11 photos, transparency two and a scene of three, also from Greenfield Park. Another, uh, this one's a wide field, of course, but it helps us to see conjunction. And this was on March 18th of this year. And um, as you know, March, it was still pretty cold here and we were deep in the middle of the COVID lockdown, but you could still enjoy astronomy and, and you know, our appreciation of the night sky. And uh, this is uh, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn all in one shot. So uh, definitely a bargain here. Um, yeah, you can actually see the wires. Um, Paul was just pointing this out to me because, uh, um, yeah, I believe those are, are wires, but it doesn't matter because he's still in his yard in Greenfield Park. And as I said, this was the height of the lockdown, and yet you can still appreciate and enjoy the night sky. So our friends are still out there, you know. This one here captured uh, Paul and I, uh, our interest because as we were editing this slideshow, we noticed that this has like a creamy, beautiful, three-dimensional feeling to the moon. Um, it's just the way this photo was taken uh, on June 4th, 2020. As I mentioned earlier, it's never the same view twice. It may be the same old moon, but it's not. Especially, it's your point of view how you capture something. So using um, uh, a 90 millimeter with the same 1000 millimeter focal length uh, um, Neptune uh, telescope using the 15 millimeter eyepiece, and the smartphone, um, Carl was able to capture this really gorgeous photo um, also from uh, Bellevue. And he goes into detail about the layers and curves. And what we could do after the talk is make this PowerPoint available as a PDF uh, to, to everybody. Uh, we'll figure out a way to, to put that on our website so people can enjoy this uh, and, and read the details uh, on, on your own. And also finally from Carl, uh, on August 3rd of this year, not too long ago, um, a beautiful, uh, pretty well, almost full image of the moon, a full moon, using his Canos EOS uh, 7 Rebel T7 and a 90 millimeter telescope with a thousand millimeter focal length. And uh, this is the best photo um, uh, choice. And uh, this camera, camera settings were on manual focus and one two thousandths of a second. So that sharp, very quick shutter speed allows you to freeze the image of the moon so you don't get any blurriness or even the uh, atmosphere at uh, the scene was three so that the atmosphere was boiling a little, but with a high shutter speed, um, you were able to capture a very steady uh, image. And yet uh, on September 4th, um, just about a month ago, uh, well, this month, uh, obviously, um, just uh, four weeks ago, um, at uh, around 11.15, uh, Carl took this uh, uh, exquisite image. Uh, really good stuff. Um, uh, uh, kudos to Carl. Here's um, a, uh, a student photo, I believe. Uh, if not, uh, please ex ex um, accept my apologies, but uh, regardless, it's a member photo from Danilo Perkov. And uh, this is a beautiful uh, full moon photo. And you can see all the rays coming out uh, of, the, of the crater. Um, uh, and like I said earlier, the full moon is a flatter image, but it's still amazing to see some beautiful contrast and details, especially if you bring it into a program like Photoshop or GIMP. You can actually play around with the contrast settings and actually bring out certain things like the, the, uh, the ejecta blanket from large meteorite impacts uh, over the moon, uh, on the moon's surface, and uh, the mare and the flatter areas of the moon. So uh, even though the full moon doesn't give us those deep shadows to enjoy, 
there's still tons of details to look at. So it's always an amazing thing. Well, uh, yours truly, um, I celebrated the 50th anniversary of the landing of, uh, of uh, people on the moon. Um, and uh, so the 50th anniversary of Apollo. And on that night uh, that Apollo landed 50 years later, I took a shot of the moon. And this is my composite of, uh, of um, an image shot with my Sony 6300 and my William Optics Megrez 90 millimeter refractor not tracking or anything, just simply on the tripod and a, a 1600 ISO um, uh, um, exposure of uh, one two hundredth of a second. And I'll share with you uh, the May Day moon uh, from, uh, from, uh, this, uh, from this season. Uh, so on May the 1st, this is what the moon looked like. And you'll see that the moon is qu never quite the same kind of tint like sometimes there's like a yellow tint or a bluish tint that depends on the uh you know the the, the sky um you know is there smoke in the sky like now we have from the forest fires from california unfortunately we have like a bit of a brown haze so that does change the the uh look of what we see uh you know through our telescopes of the moon um but sometimes it's uh, just your choice on how you want to process something you want a cold or or a warm uh, feeling uh, from the moon. But uh, here's one of my favorite views uh, where you get all these beautiful uh, craters like Plato is, uh, is um, visible where it's all flat at the bottom. That's an amazing view. Uh, from uh, Luca Di Lulo, uh, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, moon photo. As I mentioned earlier, this one seems to be a little on the cool side and I'm sure that was uh, processed that way. This is gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful contrast here. You see all the ejecta blanket from the uh, from the craters. You see the mare that really jump out. So an amazing process uh, image of this moon, and yet not quite a full moon because you could see uh, some beautiful craters um, right at the edge here. Um, this was taken on September fifteenth, twenty nineteen. Uh, so many kind thanks go out to uh, Luca. From Gerald McKenzie, uh, one of our uh, members that uh, takes a lot of photography as well. Um, here's a moon of a uh, 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 quarter plus um, uh, two days of the waxing gibbous, 71% taken this year. And then you could see the uh, um, four days waxing. So you could see the difference from a few days makes uh, on, on the view of the moon and uh, really sharp images here. Um, same thing here with uh, Q minus five and then a waxing crescent um, where it's just that classic crescent moon and yet you have the first quarter uh, moon like pretty well halfway through the phase, um, like the first quarter, 45% lit and this was in 2018 and April 22nd. So very gorgeous, crispy details, uh, really nice views here. Now we go on to something pretty amazing. Um, our member, uh, Bettina Forget, who is uh, an amazing space artist and, and, and visionary for everything to do with space, has had a program uh, through a visual voice uh, gallery and where she gives programs on how to sketch the moon. And so taking images, close-up images of uh, large um, and prominent craters, she has people take their time and with the techniques that she explains, learns how to sketch the moon. A lot of people think, well, geez, I'm not a good artist, I can't sketch. But it's not so hard actually, I've done it myself um, uh, in Toronto last year at the, uh, at the General Assembly and uh, I was kind of blown away myself even though I'm a graphic designer by trade, I rely more on my computer and Photoshop to do my uh, artwork. But just taking a, a simple pencil with uh, different techniques and smudging and, uh, and how to look at things and translate them to paper, you can actually take excellent images of the moon uh, to keep for yourself for the long term. And uh, you don't need a camera or cell phone. And this way you get to be more intimate with what you're looking at through the telescope. So uh, CJF students training session on May the 4th, 2019. This is Archimedes and uh, this is a couple of sketches. Look at this amazing uh, sketches of uh, Lambert. And you could easily see from person to person how they interpreted what they were looking at. 
Um, on the left, you have an amazing uh, sketch um, that closely resembles um, what, what you're looking at. And on the right as well, it's just from someone's different point of view and different techniques on how they uh, do these sketches. Mm -hmm. So like I said, um, don't limit yourself to just photography. Try this technique out. And um, you know, there's information uh, um, you can get through Bettina on how to, uh, on how to, um, to do these sketches. And it's, um, Nicole has been doing these sketches too. And they're quite amazing. Uh, so I have more to share. Clavius. This is, these are gorgeous, beautiful, deep craters. And in these uh, sketches um, represent that actually. You could see the high contrast and detail um, of what you're looking at. So it's pretty amazing here. Uh, Bladis, uh, it's also um, a mosaic image that was provided, but um, a beautiful sketch translated from this image. And uh, it's pretty amazing, like I said, um, when you take the time and train yourself on how to do this. I encourage everybody out there to try this and uh, to see that it's not all so intimidating as you think. Uh, Poseidonus, uh, also a beautiful crater with a lot of scarring and, uh, and deep uh, trenches and markings. Uh, beautiful subject for uh, gorgeous sketches here. Uh, same, same, uh, same thing, Poseidonus, uh, CJEP students. Um, just one second. Uh, yeah, they're the same crater. I think they're the same crater, uh, unless we mis Oops. mistaken it. Uh, yeah, we may have we may have mislabeled it. So my um, our apologies, uh, but it doesn't take away from the fact that uh, these craters here are amazing. Um, in in the sketches here, you can see details, especially the uh, cre cre uh, crevasses, and and the channels grooved into the base of the crater. It's pretty amazing uh, to see this. We'll update these slides and correct this uh, 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 in a PDF. So here's an amazing thing. Sometimes you don't always need to take super close-up images of the moon. You can take a wider view of the moon. And in this amazing picture from Koa Tran, you can actually see a conjunction of Mars and the moon. So this is my photo of the moon-Mars conjunction from this past September the 6th, shortly before 1 a.m. when they were within a degree of one another. It's still it's a single shot from a back balcony in the plateau, so you don't have to be out of town to take fantastic shots. At one two thousandth of a second and 200 uh, ISO, oh, I'm sorry, one two hundredth of a second and 200 ISO uh, through a vintage 1970s Towood 60 millimeter F5 refractor mounted on an Olympus uh, Pen F. So you don't need all these kind of crazy equipments and everything to get uh, really nice shots here, and this shows that. And uh, this is a gorgeous example of um, a conjunction. From Jane Lubensky, um, we have a set of moon photos here that are mosaic. And if for people that don't know, sometimes you're so close up to the moon through your telescope that it actually fills the entire frame and the entire field of view of that frame to the point that if you want more of the moon or the whole part of it, you actually have to take many photos and then stitch them together in a panorama using a stitching software, let's say like Photoshop or, or um, some uh, free programs online that help you with that in mosaicing. And this allows you to have extremely high resolution and have close up uh, images uh, that are amazing. So here we could see um, some beautiful details uh, and mountain valleys and ridges on the moon and very high contrast images. Uh, so an example, we're seeing tonight an example of sketches all the way up to uh, like high res images, uh, close up of the moon, all the way to uh, wide field conjunction views. So you're not limited to just taking ordinary photos of the moon. It's really up to you how you wanna do this. Well, uh, one of our uh, longtime members and, um, and president, uh, Maury Portnoff, former president, um, He's also a photographer uh, uh, with passion and, um, and, um, and uh, commercially as well. And this is some of the results here. So using this Canon 6D, a full moon, 400 millimeter lens from Canon L series, which is pretty sharp stuff, at 130, uh, 320th of a second at F7 and ISO 100 to reduce noise, you get a very high contrast view here of, of all the craters and the ejecta material with the mare, the, the oceans on the moon, let's say, uh, the, the flatter volcanic uh, fields. 
And uh, here's um, a series of photos from Maury. Beautiful details at the Terminator, um, the you know, difference between the day and night. Uh, so this is a Wayne and Gibbous, uh, same series, 400 millimeter L-series lens, 1 60th of a second at F13, ISO 160, and uh, gorgeous, beautiful details here. Nicola Port, as I mentioned earlier, um, she does sketching and she uh, helps to uh, preserve her memories of the moon um, by sketching and on tiny little um, um, square shaped cards, which she keeps. And uh, we're all fascinated with this because it's really gorgeous stuff. And here you have uh, Plinius Crater, Ross Crater, um, Masculine Crater and the Bay of Rainbows. And um, these are drawings of the moon observations through a 60 millimeter achromatic refractor telescope. So there you go. You don't need a special apochromatic multi-thousand dollar telescope to enjoy, uh, to, uh, enjoy she, she's, she's pointing to, uh, to, to really enjoy and get the maximum uh, out of things. Use what you have, you know, and enjoy what you have. And then you could always save up to get something bigger. But but look at all the great stuff you can do with modest equipment, some passion and some time. And by actually sketching the images, you actually get to be more uh, intimate with your subject because you really have to keep looking at it uh, to sketch it down on that little piece of paper. And by doing that, you get to learn your targets. I find uh, um, that's an amazing way to really get into it. Well, sometimes the moon is obscured by the Earth's shadow, and this is the case from Mark Ricard. It's a lunar eclipse image captured from his backyard in Point Claire on September 27th, 2015. Seems like an eternity ago. Uh, through my four inch refractor with my modified Canon 60D. It's a single four second exposure at ISO 800. The double star to the right, uh, uh, just to the right is STF 23 in Pisces. And this deep orange tint is of course caused by, um, you know, the Earth's atmosphere um, with the dust and all of, all of the um, aerosols in the atmosphere as we're passing, uh, the shadow passes over the moon, we get to see that. And uh, this is incredible coppery red uh, blood moon look that you see during the deepest parts of lunar eclipses. An absolutely stunning image here. Here's an example, finally, from Terry Doucette of a moon photo. And here it's kind of like a close up. It's a setting moon on the eight inch Dobsonian with his nine millimeter lens and iPhone clamped to the lens. And as simple as that, you take your uh, cell phone and there are uh, inexpensive adapters. Um, a good one's from Celestron for about $60, $69 here in Montreal. Um, but it doesn't matter, even if you just take your phone like we do with many uh, public nights and just put it level to the eyepiece using the rubber eye cup many times to keep it as uh, level as possible. You can get these great images of the moon uh, through a simple phone that most of us have. So you don't need all these fancy couplers, adapters and, and crazy things. You just need to do it, that's all. Um, so um, without any further um, items, uh, this concludes this component of the slideshow. And like I said earlier, We'll uh, update a couple of small uh, typos and post it as a PDF uh, for everybody to enjoy. We'll figure out uh, posting this on our website, ricmontreal.org. Uh, um, um, so uh, that's it. Are there any questions from anybody out there um, for anything or anybody? Or does anybody want to add to anything? Because the moon is an amazing thing. Actually, uh, Nicole's uh, telescope in the background there is pretty nice there. She's got a, it's sitting there, her 60 millimeter refractor there. She's, yeah. uh, we know that uh, Nicole has uh, this uh, talent for bringing uh, telescopes back to life and making them portable and creating fantastic results with it. And uh, so uh, maybe if you say something, Nicole, uh, well, the picture will flip to you instead of David. Um. Well, uh, what I find with, because often the yeah, little telescopes, they get a bad rap because the problem with the telescopes is not the tube itself. Um, it's all the accessories that come with it. So I, I bought a, a really cheap telescope on Amazon and it, it was terrible. Like the, 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 the legs of the tripod were the size of my fingers and the, um, 
the eyepieces were horrible. I mean, if you took these eyepieces and put on a really expensive telescope, that telescope would be terrible. So what I did is I found some old, um, from an old Japanese telescope, uh, stronger wooden legs to give it more stable. And at a swap sale, I found an old um, telescope mount with the, that has um, slow motion controls for the up and down, uh, uh, alt and azimuth also the left and right. So um, I kind of like little telescopes because they're portable. And um, if, even if you have an old, clanky telescope and um, it's like uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas tree if you give it a bit of love you'll be surprised if you change some of the eyepieces and maybe if the mount is a bit wobbly if you make an effort to change the tripod legs there's a lot you can do with even just a little 60 millimeter not just the moon I was surprised it was good with the planets and some of the brighter Messier objects especially the open star clusters and some of the uh, double stars as well so you know um, the little telescopes get a bad rap but if you have one use it and you'll be surprised what you can see with it and um, usually uh, the problem with them again is the eyepiece you might want to invest in a if it has the smaller eyepieces the 0.965 you might want to invest in an adapter to have a one and a quarter inch eyepiece um, and also I've changed the um, the viewfinder, um, I don't know, you see there, usually the viewfinders on these little telescopes are very small. And if you get a bigger one, a six by 30 instead of a five by 24. So five would be the magnification and 24 is the diameter. While as better telescopes come with a six by 30, so six magnification and 30 diameter. And then you can see quite a bit more because uh, it's um, the viewfinder is important when you're looking for objects in the sky to find them around where it is and then you look in your telescope because if you just try to find it through the telescope it can be quite frustrating so um, maybe one day I'd like to make a workshop on uh, if you have like a, a little telescope that's not great how to make it much better <laughs> That would be amazing, Nicole. Yeah. Uh, that's a good idea for a future topic. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a small telescope advocate. <laughs> <laughs> well, look look what it's brought you. You know, all these amazing yeah. sketches you've done. Um, you've been a member for over 10 years now, and uh, yeah. uh, you've done some pretty amazing stuff. So uh, thank you for oh, all of us. Thank you. And I have bigger telescopes, but I find for the moon, even with the bigger telescopes, the little ones almost do just as good of a job. That's the one good advantage about 60 millimeter refractors for the moon. They're quite good. Any other uh, questions or comments for anybody? And especially uh, Nicole? Uh, Tiago asked about the next solar eclipse. Uh, when it is. The next solar eclipse is this, uh, well, just before Christmas, it would have been in, uh, um, uh, well, in Argentina, right, on uh, the 16th, I believe, of December or the 14th. Um, some of us were planning a trip to go down there, but unfortunately, um, unfortunately, you know, due to world circumstances, that's not going to be possible. But at least we could watch it live. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, talking about the moon, if Santiago was thinking more about lunar eclipse. Because we haven't had one in Montreal in well a few years now so we're going to look up that up um so for the next solar eclipse the next full solar eclipse is this uh december and the next lunar eclipse at least here in montreal uh would be just give us a second november 30th of this year yeah well according to a pulse on november 30th of this year um, really? Yeah. Really? Lunar Eclipse, Montreal, November 30th, 2020. November 30th, 2020. At 2.30 in the morning. At 2.30 in the morning, there's supposed to be, uh, it's a, a penumbral, total. Well, penumbral. Oh, it's a penumbral eclipse. Um, yeah. We're going to try to find out if the next full solar eclipse, uh, lunar total. eclipse. Total eclipse, Thank you so much, Nicole and David. You guys are awesome. Thank you. 
Um, I just have to share my screen one more time because I think there was a question about um, French resources. Um, if I can share my screen. Okay, just, uh, just to quickly answer the question about lunar eclipses, May 26, 2021 is the next, the next total for Montreal. Well, there you go. Something to look forward to for next spring. Yes, this is the um, Observe the Moon website. Uh, it's the RAS National website, but they have a web page just for Explore the Moon. Um, and yes, there is um, this here, but also um, there's in French, there's also, uh, this is available. And I think it was translated by, it wasn't translated by uh, Pierre Meignier, I think. But anyways, yes, um, les ressources sont aussi disponibles en français. Um, and you uh, can file the program in French or in English here. Um, if I click on this, this is the PDF for the small telescope. So it kind of just explains uh, what I touched upon and all the features and how to go about doing the program. So if you get this PDF, it'll explain the whole program to you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, if there's no other further questions, I guess that would conclude uh, uh, this presentation for tonight. And I thank everybody for kindly taking your time uh, to be with us tonight, and especially to Nicole, uh, Karim, for setting up um, all the logistics of this to happen. I'd have to thank Paul for helping control the uh, slides uh, on our side and helping to put together that PowerPoint uh, slideshow. We did that together. And like I said, we'll just quickly update a couple of typos and save it as a PDF and uh, have it available on our website for people to download and look at the notes um, so we could all enjoy those uh, beautiful sketches and photos. Just a quick correction. I'm sorry, tw May 26, 2021 is not a total lunar eclipse. Uh, it's only a partial, a penumbral again. Uh, so the next total of lunar eclipse for Montreal is not till May uh, 2022. See, now we got to wait another year because of Paul. Yes, that's right. So, uh, yeah, May, tw May of 2022 is a full eclipse, but we could do a practice run uh, next spring if we can actually get out of our shells. Um, okay, so um, I know that there's a link that's provided to go to uh, viewing the moon through NASA. Um, I'm sure they'll have better luck than the clouds here in Montreal, of course. Um, and I know the planetarium had their program where they were sharing the, the views of the moon live tonight. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, um, we don't always control the weather. Um, so, uh, so that's it for now. And if you guys want to stay on, uh, we'll stop recording, but then we can have a free for all. Um, is there anything that anybody else wanted to say before we sign out of the recording? Just a heads up that I'm outside and I actually had the moon sitting in my view until the clouds completely covered it over, but uh, the clouds hadn't come, we would have been able to share it with everyone. So I'm glad that we had the sketches and the pictures from the members. That was really nice. Well, they're amazing stuff. And uh, the fun part is it's a whole Lacey variety. Castillo. Oh, I'm sorry. Charisse. Sorry. Oh, yeah, we, uh, we're testing that link from NASA, actually. Here, um, where's my chat box? There's the chat box. Okay, so we just sent the link in the chat box so you can look at uh, what's going on with NASA. Um, and uh, sorry, Karim, we sent the cloud your way from Code St. Luke. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so with that said, I guess I'll stop recording this. Okay, well, thank you uh, once more and we'll look forward to our next uh, Zoom meeting. <laughs>